Revti, you can start. Okay. Um, sure, thank you, Ram. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of the participants of the VisionAid webinar today. I'm Revati Ramakrishna, co-founder and vice president of VisionAid. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our amazing speaker for this evening, Dr. Linda Lawrence, an internationally renowned ophthalmologist who runs her private practice in comprehensive ophthalmology with pediatric emphasis in Kansas, US. A vocal advocate for earlier detection and interventions, she has documented the high rate of undiagnosed ocular pathology in infants and toddlers with developmental disabilities and co-authored a book chapter on pediatric low vision. She has worked with the WHO International Consensus Scientific Committee to develop the International Low Vision Rehabilitation Standards and spoken at many international conferences and trained trainers in the area of early intervention for infants and toddlers with low vision and multiple disabilities all over the world. She volunteers with several organizations, Orbis, Kansas State School for the Blind, Centro and Sullivan del Peru for students with neurodevelopmental disabilities, uh, in Lima with the CDC on congenital Zika syndrome and the University of Kansas as a volunteer assistant clinical professor of ophthalmology. The Do Dr. Lawrence has numerous awards to her name, International Humanitarian Services Award, Senior Achievement Award and Secretariat Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology and an Achievement Award from American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Ram and I had the pleasure of meeting Linda at Madurai when she joined us for the inauguration of the VisionAid National Resource Center um, at Arvind Eye Hospital. Since then, she has kept in touch with us, providing valuable inputs and guidance. Thank you so much, Linda, for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you very much for that kind um, introduction. I'm very humbled by it and I, I really thank you all for taking this initiative to put together this really amazing series of speakers and um, there's I think there are very many providers in the world who are really really wanting more information on low vision especially in infants and small children because there's not a lot available um, we do a really good job of saving vision, saving eyes, saving lives, but not so good a job at the rehabilitation or habilitation part of our professions. So mainly this talk is not about every detail in visual development, but mainly to give an overall feeling of what the needs of a child and a family might be. This is different than most of us are, who are ophthalmologists or optometrists are trained. We're trained really well in science and diagnosis of disease and how to fix something. But when we can't fix it, we're not as comfortable with our next steps. So um, I've had a lot of mentors, including Dr. Leah, Gordon Dutton. I work with Sharon Lehman, Terry Schwartz, Melinda Rainey, Dr. Ritchie from Rome who have all been colleagues of mine and we learn from each other. And many of the slides are from all of us. So I, I can't take credit for all the slides. We share a lot of them. Um, also thanks to the hospital in Madurai um, for their work in early intervention as we explored how this might fit into the overall um, low vision project and ultimately the um, that vision aid assisted with. And also the Altino Ventura Foundation Brazil who allowed me to come and help them set up early intervention when we had the congenital Zika epidemic. So we're, we've all learned from each other. It, this is not just my work, um, but all of ours. Oh, let's see. Now, how do I advance slide? Okay. So what, one of the most important things is to realize that a child with a visual impairment develops functions and concepts based on a blurred or fragmented image. This is different than an adult. Most adults who develop visual impairment 
already have a visual memory. So if you just remember the key thing in children is they are using vision to develop concepts. Also motor, social, emotional, and cognitive skills. Again, an adult who's lost vision may have already developed those with a use of vision. So it's, it's just different. Children are not just little adults. They are developing little people. So why is vision even important? Um, vision promotes early motivation to move. That's one thing that's so important in early childhood development. At two months, a child should be following a moving object. By three months, the arms and eyes begin to act together and the child actually can start hitting an object. Now it's object recognition that's going to move that child from his egocentric area in himself out to explore the world. Object recognition then brings the infant out into world experience. Okay, if, they, if the child doesn't have vision, they're not gonna understand unless they're trained that there's a world out there. At four to six months, this is a critical age for visual and motor development. The child's starting to reach, grasp, manipulate objects, and notice near and far relationships. By 18 months, the child's starting to crawl, again, moving the world out. In nine to 12 months, the child would typically begin pulling and standing and develop that little pincher grass that helps them pick up small objects. So remember, Vision drives development, and also development drives use of vision. So vision provides experience for concept development and cognition. Again, if the child doesn't get that information visually, we need to be able to provide access to those experiences, either by auditory or tactile um, technology, other things, because without vision, or with low vision, empty language may develop. The child becomes egocentric and the language is um, small and fragmented because their experience is small and fragmented. And the child may have difficulty with social aspects of language. How do you describe a smile or understand a smile if you've never seen one? Vision is important for social emotional development. And one point I wanna make here is that remember that parents are the main teacher of the child. Okay, parents have a baby 24 seven. And I think one of the things this pandemic has taught a lot of us is that the children can't just go to therapy. They can't always go to school, but the parent has them at home. And if they know how to use everyday experiences and routines to help further the child's development, not only in vision, but in all other ways, then that child's gonna have a much greater advantage than waiting in a time like now, a pandemic time, with no access to, to therapist. So very important to train parents and keep the parents as part of your team. We need to remember that the impact of visual impairment starts at birth. The mutual eye gaze between the infant and the cares facilitates attachment. If this attachment doesn't occur early on, then those communications between the parent and the infant is challenged, and this may last a, a lifetime and actually set up for a pattern of um, depression and um, social emotional um, challenges. The other thing to remember is that visual impairment in each child is different and how that child's going to develop will be unique. A child is not a diagnosis. A diagnosis helps us to look for other things, to, to get an understanding of the child, but it does not define the child or the family. This is a really nice poster that was put together um, um, at Aravind Eye Care System in, in Madurai along with um, USAID. Um, and it's, it's something that, again, a lot of us have not been trained in visual developmental milestones 
or an early development of the child. So having a poster like this that shows us professionals and parents about early childhood visual development. For example, looking at the mother's face by age six weeks, um, interacting with the mom at three months, reaching up at six months, looking in a mirror, all of these things that the parents can be trained to look at so they understand if their child is not doing this, that they should let their pediatrician, their, their nurse, some healthcare worker know so they can get the proper referrals. Now, we um, validated a, a battery of visual de developmental milestones during the um, congenital Zika virus um, epidemic. And um, we were trying to figure out how to measure um, the, the severe visual impairment in these infants that we knew had cerebral or cortical visual impairment, but also ocular lesions and ocular motor lesions and really severe seizure disorders and a lot of things. So we wanted to put together some kind of a, a simple, um, for us ophthalmologists, right? A simple visual developmental milestone um, testing battery. So this is published in JPOS in 2018, and I invite you to look at it because it, it is in the peer-reviewed journal and is validated. And also, it was measured against um, um, a group of 90 children who were born at the same time, age matched, and our um, uh, battery of tests showed in the, the control group that close to 100% of children were doing these um, or, or had achieved these visual milestones at the age that we had suspected. And then again, matching to the children with the congenital Zika syndrome, that there was definite delay in these visual milestones. So it's a, it's a really nice, very simple um, group of at eight weeks making eye contact, three months having a social smile in regard to the hands, at five to six months doing goal-directed reach. So a toy in front of the child moves that child out to reach and the child brings their hands to the midline to an object or to their carer's face. At seven to ten months then the child begins to regard facial features and would give a smile back give a frown back, under, start to understand the meaning of their parents' facial expressions. And 11 to 12 months would be when a child would reach for a dangling object. So this is an easy way to screen babies um, to, to see if they need further um, evaluation. We need to remember that visual function describes how the eye works. This is, again, as eye care professionals, we're used to describing the function of the eye, the vision, the contrast sensitivity, visual field, color vision, but we're not so used to looking at functional vision, which describes how that baby would use the vision in vision-related activities. This is the four-leaf clover of vision you all have seen before, and what does the baby need vision for? Mobility. Um, sustained near vision tasks, communication, just eating, learning how to smile. All of this is so important. And if the child doesn't have adequate vision for this, then we need to help with intervention strategies. I wanted to point out here in the, the um, ET ROP study, this is so important to remember that in those children who had favorable structural retinal outcomes, after ROP treatment, 14% still had unfavorable functional vision outcome. It's not good enough for us to just treat the eye disease. We need to treat the whole baby. Babies with poor visual res responses may fit into different categories. And I'm not gonna go through every category or every list of, of what the causes are. You can look that up. But just to think in the categories, they can have an ocular condition. They could have cognitive or intellectual disability that doesn't allow them to use their vision properly. They could have cortical or cerebral visual impairment and this could is secondary to brain-based or neurological visual impairment, and that can start at the time of birth. 
A child with cerebral palsy may have poor visual responses because of damage to the visual pathways. And this might go unrecognized because the cerebral palsy, the, the motor impairment, is more obvious. And that may get all of the attention and the poor vision or visual responses may go unnoticed. Children with autism spectrum disorder can have poor visual responses and really need to be watched because they may end up having also ocular um, conditions that need attention and they may also have cortical or cerebral visual impairment. There's another group of children, babies with poor visual responses, that seem to catch up at about six months and have no other pathology and appear typical. We call those group of children delayed visual maturation. I want to emphasize that delayed visual maturation is a diagnosis that's made retrospectively. We can only make the, that diagnosis when the child has then developed typical um, visual responses or has an, another diagnosis. Delayed visual maturation is not a diagnosis. We use, um, I, I want to show you now uh, our, our simple battery of tests and how we use testing or assessment to recommend intervention strategies. And these are a mirror, some uh, grading acuities, a contrast sensitivity test, a test for visual attention, and two small objects to try and um, look at shift of gaze. This is a real basic early screen for babies. Now you can also see myself in the um, resident physician, if you look at our clothing, we have very plain clothing so that the testing material shows up well. If your clothing is too complex, then the child may be distracted from the testing that you're trying to do. The mirror test is just a, a super test to use, and um, uh, it's validated as a measurement for visual acuity by Dr. Richard Bowman, um, and it's published. And I love to bring this mirror um, when I'm assessing babies because you can see this little girl is looking at herself directly in the mirror at a distance of about two meters. And we can then use that to tell the parent and, and the interventionist, you know, at about four meters, double the distance, the child is likely to be able to see facial expressions. It's a mirror, so you double the distance. And Dr. Bowman actually has it calibrated so that the distance the child can see themselves can equate into an actual visual acuity. Again, I wanna call your attention to the background. We have a, a sheet that's covering up all the busy things in our office, and I'm wearing dark clothes so that my clothing doesn't interfere with, with her attention um, to, the, to the test. So visual attention, um, I use this small paddle. Um, it's a five inch um, paddle um, to actually see if the child can hold attention to that paddle. Um, we find clinically there's not really a standard established, but a typically developing child after the age of about two months will hold fixation on that paddle for about 10 seconds. And what we wanna remember is visual attention is closely tied to cognitive development. And you can see we this can, little we baby. We can just show first, we can show the, the paddle and then twinkle little, twinkle little star, how I wonder what you are above. So he's able to hold the fixation for about three seconds. I'm singing a little nursery rhyme in the back to calm him. And he is able to very, very slowly track that paddle. Um, after a, uh, given a lot of time. So we know this child has um, a delay in his visual attention. We need to present things to him with very high contrast and very slowly giving can, him plenty first, of time the, to, to process the, the information. So you, you'd want to have some small objects here to measure shift, shift of gaze. And again, if we look at this little boy, we're trying to look at his saccades. Can he move from one object to the other? And he has great difficulty doing this. He's not really able to shift his eyes between the two objects, even given plenty of times. And that's in contrast to this little girl who just watch, it takes her a long time, but eventually using 
actually she has ocular motor apraxia and actually moves wow. her head to in, institute a, a move in the direction of the object and given plenty of time she is able to then look at the object um, but children like this with neurological brace um, or neurological based brain um, or visual dysfunction they need a lot of time okay one way we can measure um, how the child's seeing and then compare them to themselves over time is using a preferential looking test and there's a variety of tests these are Leia grading paddles and they go from a larger stripe to smaller um, this is actually the um, graph that shows what a typically um, visually developing child would be able to see. Um, I find um, many of my children that I see score very low on the test, but then as they come in after they've had intervention, I can measure them against themselves. This tool may even be valuable in older children and sometimes even adults who are nonverbal or cognitive cognitively can't understand some of our other testing methods. So this is just a demonstration of how these paddles might be used. You can use them vertically or sideways. Again, when the, the one paddle has a gray um, surface and the other ones you can see how the, the, the stripes. And we look for the child to shift his head or turn his eyes towards the stripes. Another valuable test are teller acuity cards. Um, these are, are more costly, a little more cumbersome um, to use in, in babies, but they're also a, a very, very good method of looking at how small, what's the acuity, how small can that um, child see. The contrast test is another really important test to use, and this is one that Dr. Leia designed for babies, and it has um, on the far right is the control face, and you hold the blank page, and then the face, you hide the face behind the blank, blank page, bring the face out, and again, watch for the child's head to shift or eyes to shift towards that face. And this is a demonstration with our little baby again, and he wasn't really even able to um, perceive where the face was or follow the face. So we would know in this child that he definitely needs increase in contrast and slower um, time to process the image. So this is another baby, and the way I use this is I look and see if they can get, come down to the 5% contrast, which he will. And then I move away from the child to see how far he can see that 5% contrast face. The reason being that the 5% has been identified as approximate contrast of the human face. So if they're able to see the 5% at 30 centimeters, 60 centimeters, three meters, that again gives us a clue that they may be able to see their parent or care's facial expression at that distance. So you can see he's looking towards the face. And then I'm gonna just move back. And he, he looks at, at the face again. So it's a good clue that he's able to see facial expressions at that distance. Again, none of these tests are 100%. They give you a clue to what the child might be seeing. And this is just a slide to, to illustrate the importance of contrast. The middle picture would be um, a child in the, in the newborn period with about 2400 vision. And you can see how the outline of my dark hair against the lighter face and then the darker clothes shows where my face is. So, you know, a baby, you know, is gonna see a blurred image when they first start looking. But if you have your parent um, or care get, do more contrast in their hair, on their face, sometimes with a man, it can be a beard or a mustache, um, a bright scarf underneath the neck, a scarf around the head, something that gives contrast to the color of, of the face. 
We can assess visual field defects in children. Um, this, this baby up at the top again has um, cerebral visual impairment um, from congenital Zika syndrome. She has microcephaly and was thought to be totally blind. And what we found is we placed an object in her superior field. In this case, it's my iPad and she could follow it everywhere, you know, and this, this little boy um, from India down here on the bottom, it was the same thing. You know, he had, we were putting everything down in front of him where he had no visual field. So he was functionally blind in that field. But once the object was placed in the seeing field, he was, they were both able to perceive it. So we can use that information, for example, in this little baby showing feeding instead of bringing a spoon or the bottle up from below where the child has not a clue what's happening all of a sudden something's popping in their mouth and they don't know what it is you could bring it from their seeing field describing it food bite with a simple word like that and let the child see and be part of the experience um, using their vision the layup puzzle we use in older children and um, at about 14 months, we have children that can start doing this. And it's a really valuable test for me. I use it um, on all children, whether they have a visual impairment, whether they have a cognitive impairment. Um, I, I use it to watch if, they have, if they're developing the concepts from abstract, uh, sorry, from concrete to abstract. So the, the one side has the color um, clues to it. The reverse side takes away the color clues. Now remember that color is one of the most primitive responses um, in, in our visual system, in the brain. So color is, can be a very, very important um, clue to um, matching to what an object is, to the experience of an object. You take away the color and things get a little bit harder. And then finally we go to this two-dimensional card which has taken away the concreteness of the test. It's no longer an object, it's a picture of the object. So doing that with children then leads us to see if they could understand doing an actual chart with, with the optotypes. And children, even children with severe um, cerebral palsy can be trained to do this test. And I wanna show you this little boy with congenital Zika. Yay! And watch that success. That was just a really moving moment for all of us to see that little boy who understood the test. He couldn't speak, he could hardly move, but he figured out how to do that puzzle. <laughs> so how early is early to, to start measuring visual acuity and visual function in children? Well, Dr. Daniela Ricci has written quite a few articles and developed this methods with, method with her colleagues in Rome on assessment of the child in the NICU. And what they've documented is that fixing and tracking are already present in preterm babies at 30 to 32 weeks of gestational age. So early is at birth, <laughs> that you can start at birth. Their um, neonatal assessment of visual function um, sponsored through the Mariani Foundation Project um, it's an ideal test. It has a structure protocol. It assesses several aspects of visual function. It's short. It's easy for non-eye um, care specialists to learn. It has minimal and very inexpensive equipment. They can use it in, in the NICU inside an incubator because it's easy to clean and it's, it's reliable. It's currently undergoing testing in 11 centers in Italy, or was, I guess. Hopefully still is, but, um, and she uses a variety of targets you can read about and has actually a chart that you can um, um, score the child and, um, and then track the vision. I want to leave from there and go into one of the things that I feel very strongly about, and that's glasses in babies and small children with proper refraction. And if any of you have heard me talk before, you know that this is something I really emphasize. Photo screeners should not be used in under one for um, th these machines are fooled by accommodation. It should be used as a guide and remember that they were developed only for screening for amblyogenic factors. A lot of people want to use these for refraction. That's not why they were developed. 
So when you're doing a refraction in an infant or small child, you need to think about it. You need to remember all children deserve a cycloplegic refraction, especially those with low vision, and that dynamic retinoscopy needs to be done with proper correction and prior to um, dilation. I want to talk a minute about what's a significant refractive error and especially about who made the rules. A lot of us have used this guideline that was a consensus opinion from APOS members in 1998 with only a 68% uh, response rate. These were guidelines for refraction in children under age three that were typically developing and does not have evidence an evidence base. This was based on clinical impression and it was a consensus opinion. So I want you all to be very careful in using these as your gold standard. They weren't meant to be that. We need to really develop a different guide for children with additional disabilities and those with low vision. So this is not a, a table to use. You need to do the refraction and think about it. You need to treat the accommodative esotropia, use bifocals as needed, um, correct the anisometropia and amblyopia for the children. And dynamic retinoscopy, once you start doing it, you're gonna just love it. It gives you so much information. You can see here's a child from um, Nigeria that we found was a very high plus, plus five. And the question is, well, you know, he's a baby. Does he need that plus five? We measured his accommodation. He did not accommodate enough um, to, to change. Remember when you're doing dynamic retinoscopy, you're looking for that change from plus motion to, to minus. Um, we put the glasses on him. I often have a trial set of glasses, did the, ret the dynamic retinoscopy again, and he was able to, to focus. So we knew that child needed that glasses and would benefit from them. So learn how to do dynamic retinoscopy and use it. That will tell you whether you need to do over plus in a baby, whether you need a, a bifocal in an older child. And this is published now. I, as far as I know, it's the only evidence base for this procedure that I learned from Dr. Leia. Many of you have. Um, this test was done, uh, our data was collected from 60 children with congenital Zika virus who all had um, CVI. They were all severely visually impaired. 42% had ocular lesions. They were just babies, the average close to a year of age. 81% had hypoaccommodation. So what we did is measured the refraction, added plus three, which is the technique I learned from Dr. Leia, which in the, the sense is to make up for the communication distance at 30 centimeters that a visually impaired child would have with its parent or carer. And, um, and we gave the glasses to the children. When we received the glasses, which was in a, a very short time, within a, a few weeks to a month, we, the children came back, we measured again all the visual functions that we'd done before. Then we put the glasses on the child and immediately measured the response. We saw a 62% immediate improvement in the visual responses in these children. And you can read the article, but what that showed us is it's worth a try. It's not 100%, um, but it's definitely something to have in your toolbox of things to try in a child with um, low vision or CVI. I like to have a, tr a trial set of a plus glasses made up so I can test them um, because you want the parents to really buy into this. And you can see in this child, I had the right prescription glasses for him. He wasn't accommodating. He needed a plus four. I had a pair of plus fours. He made eye contact with his mom. And that was her desire. I said, what questions do you have? What can I help you? I want my child to look at my eyes. And we were able to demonstrate that, get him the proper glasses and um, help with that, you know, social interaction with the parent, um, which is so important. Now the glasses need to fit properly. In this case, you know, the eye is being smashed shut by the glasses. That's not a good thing that can induce amblyopia. In this lower picture, you can see the earpiece is really hurting his little ear. So of course that child's not gonna wanna wear glasses. And this little girl has a, um, with the little pink glasses, has a proper fitting pair of glasses. She can open her eyes, it's not hitting her eyelashes, they're comfortable, and that's what we need to do. 
There's other uses for glasses and low vision. Um, magnification, remember, we do that for adults. Why don't we think about magnification for children? It's because typically we think they can accommodate, but that is not, as we've shown in a, a lot of our clinical work, that is not the case in many children. Sometimes um, the glasses, if they have a thick frame, can have a blinder effect that can help those that have attention deficits or difficulty with a lot of clutter. Remember that protection from injury to um, the remaining site is very important. We can use transition lenses or tints for photophobia. And remember, this all needs to be individualized. There's not one size fits all. You have got to explain to the family and the educational team and therapy team why the glasses are, are being worn and what's the expected outcome. We want them to promote visual, social, motor development and communication skills. It's difficult to assess this outcome and there are family quality of life is issues that need to be addressed for every child. There may be a role for refractive surgery in some cases where there's developmental disabilities and extreme refractive errors or um, anisometropia. Um, there's a book available online that talks about glasses and birth to three in the New Mexico School for the Blind. Um, you're welcome to look at it. We have a template. I'm sure they'd be happy if you wanted to use the template and, and um, use it in different languages. So just a brief word about what we're doing now in the time of COVID during this pandemic. Like everyone else, we're having to use technology. We, in the US, we typically go into the family's home to offer therapy to, um, and training of the parent um, for children with low vision, visual impairment, but now we're having to do it online via Zoom. And I think it's been a very valuable tool and I'm gonna continue using it in my assessments of children. This, for example, the, the picture's blurry because it's a screenshot. And this child, the team and the parent really were uncertain why she was doing this extreme head turn and face turn. In reviewing her medical history, she had had a brain bleed at birth, and she was actually using this to compensate for her loss of visual field. So even though I couldn't touch the child and hold them and do what I usually like to do, I could tell and support the parent and the team and tell them this is this is her way to compensate, allow her to do this, understand it. And as things open up, we can further evaluate her for orientation mobility. But we can start now with some of that even online. Of course, what you can't do is a lot of the components of the medical eye exam, but who knows what the future will hold. This was another child that we were able to, to look at his scanning, check his visual fields, um, check his, uh, uh, I've also been able to check accommodation. If the child will get close enough to the screen, you can actually watch their accommodation, alignment, visual field, and scanning. You can look at head tilts. I've had parents do cover patch one eye and we watch the child pinch something, cover the other eye to monitor amblyopia. Um, but mainly this has served as a tool to really support parents during this time when if they have a child with a visual impairment, especially visual impairment and additional disabilities, which many might have, they feel very isolated. And this technology um, and just talking with the parents and answering a few questions about the child's use of vision um, can be really helpful. So I invite you to think about using technology during this time. And we should share our experiences with this because this is kind of a new thing for us in the low vision field is how do we use this technology to support our patients, our, our students, and our, and our families. So I'm going to end there. Here's my email. And if anybody would like to email me questions, I, I get sometimes 100 emails in a day, um, especially during the time of the pandemic. So if I don't answer, don't hesitate to email me back. <laughs> okay. And I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, this is Lubaina, Dr. Lawrence, um, pediatric occupational therapist, and I can't even begin to tell you how refreshing your talk was. It felt like it was coming from an occupational therapist's perspective. 
Uh, I loved, I mean, and all the diagnosis that you spoke, I work in the public schools, so I don't per se work with visually impaired, but believe me, I have children who manifest so many symptoms, you know, because all those diagnoses that you spoke in, you know, the first couple of slides we have in the public schools. And uh, it's heartwarming to see an ophthalmologist, you know, approach low vision from a very therapist perspective, you know, looking at all the milestones and the perception and the color and, uh, you know, things that are so critical for early education. So I don't really have questions, but I just wanted to tell you it was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you very much. I, I have to say that I've been working with teachers and OTs for over 30 years and they've trained me. <laughs> so. They're definitely part of my team, and, and I continue to learn a lot. We, we, we hold actual clinics together on a monthly basis for babies for nearly 30 years, so I've learned a lot from, from, from my colleagues in the OTs and PTs and the speech-language pathologists. It's just been a great relationship. Yes, the team approach is so critical, and this was amazing. Thank you. Usually, you know, the MDs are not part of, you know, this part of the this aspect of the team and it's it was very refreshing to hear your talk thank you and and hopefully this will inspire some of my um ophthalmology colleagues and optometry colleagues to to become more involved with this because we can all learn from each other and that so helps the the family and the and the babies rather than us each being in our our sphere absolutely absolutely thank you again thank you If anyone has any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask. I didn't see any questions in the chat, so, so feel free to ask the question. I think it was so comprehensive that there are no questions, really. <laughs> it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Yes, was, yeah, excellent talk, uh, Dr. Laura. Fabulous talk, yep. Thank you. Um, I have one question about the numbers of children you see. I mean, uh, here versus in other countries. I know you've been to many countries. Mm -hmm. Is there any difference in the total numbers and also like the percentages, like in terms of the prevalence? And, you know, if you've noticed differences, why would those differences exist? And you can take maybe an example of India. I know you've done a lot of work there at Arvind versus here. Mm -hmm. So if you had any observations or thoughts about that, well, the, uh, you know, we have some things that um, now we can diagnose prenatally, we can intervene earlier, things like glaucoma, retinopathy of prematurity, you know, some of these type of diseases, cataracts and, and babies. And, you know, as, as, as we're getting better and better with treating those conditions, again, that's country to country, it varies a little bit those are becoming less an issue and what we're seeing more of are brain-based visual impairment that are needing our attention. The other reason for an increase in brain-based visual impairment, which would be uh, from a variety of causes, from prematurity, needle natal, um, an anoxia, um, genetic syndromes, um, trauma, you know, the, the infection, there's a whole host of reasons we now have much better prenatal and perinatal care of the infant. So we have a much higher survival rate now of very small babies, babies with um, say heart disease, who have Down syndrome, babies who um, are born at, I mean, we have 22 and a half week infants. We have a lot of babies born now that uh, are actually thriving because of our better neonatal care. And that's changing the face of visual impairment, um, of the reasons for visual impairment. So for example, um, in the United States, we find about 25% of our newly diagnosed visual impairment from birth to age three now is from brain-based or CVI, um, cerebral cortical visual impairment. Um, Aravind Madurai put together their statistics not long ago and they had the exact same numbers, 25%. So as India is getting better and better neonatal care, they're starting to see new things like 
more retinopathy of prematurity. And that's why you see just Indies develop some fabulous programs for, you know, finding those babies and, and doing early treatment. We're seeing in Nigeria now the same pattern. Um, they're getting much better neonatal care in their infants. And they, in the last two years, have set up a, a really amazing retinopathy of prematurity program. And they're seeing babies with ROP. And it used to be, oh, you know, Ari said, oh, that's not going to happen in Africa. They don't have that. They have, there's something about their genetics that makes it different. No, those babies don't survive. And that was all wrong. <laughs> you just had to look for it. So sometimes some of the visual impairments that we're seeing now are not so obvious and are not picked up early, especially those that are brain-based. And that's why that first slide about, you know, if the child's visual development's delayed, we need to look for reasons. It might not be so obvious. You might not be able to look at the baby and say, oh, one eye's smaller, or one eye's not there, or their eye's glassy, or, you know, you, you, it may not be so obvious, and other physical or motor impairments may be more obvious. So keeping our index of suspicion high when the milestones aren't met, may lead to us, you know, right now everything's changing. So um, uh, in, the, in, the more, in the countries that have really good neonatal intensive care, which is many now, um, we're seeing just a whole changing pattern of, of visual impairment and blindness. Thank you, very interesting. Hello. Yes. Dr. Lawrence, thank you very much, Dr. Lawrence. This is MS Raju from Vishakhapatnam. Hi. Uh, is there any evidence that consanguinal marriages result in babies who are visually impaired? Well, you know, I think that's, that's kind of a really broad, you know, area. I mean, it would be, that would come under, are there genetic conditions where in a consanguineous marriage, if, if you have two recessive genes that, that meet, then that would lead to a visual impairment. I mean, in, in general, you know, it'd be hard to make a comment in general, but, but if there's recessive genes and there's a consanguineous marriage, those recessive genes could be expressed for a variety of different eye conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, good morning, uh, Dr. Lawrence Deepak here. Uh, 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 wonderful talk. I just wanted to clarify that in uh, young kids, when you prescribe addition lenses, uh, do you consider giving progressive or uh, bifocals only? And if not progressive, then why not? Uh, because of the cosmetic reason at times, I feel that progressive may be better option. So just wanted to know your opinion about it. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, the usually, and again, these are just, this is just a guideline, but if the baby's not walking, we tend and, and is mainly feeding, doing close work, um, looking at mom's face, we tend to put the whole prescription in, in the glasses because the child doesn't know to look down through a bifocal. Um, when they start walking, I typically transition to bifocal with a line because I like the bifocal to be two thirds the height of the of the lens because the baby doesn't know to look through the bifocal. The toddler doesn't know they're supposed to look through a bifocal. The, you know, that's not a concept a child has. I hear a lot of times, you know, the parents say, oh, my child doesn't like their glasses. No child likes their glasses. You know, they have to be trained to wear them. And in an older child, sometimes I will use a multifocal, sure. Um, kids with cerebral palsy, um, uh, Dr. Dutton's actually done a paper that shows the success rate in multifocals. So again, you cannot say one rule for all children. You have to look at each child okay look at their motor abilities, um, their ability to move their head, um, to their ability to move their eyes to look through a bifocal. Do they have an inferior visual field defect? Do they just need them for close up? Is that the only time they're gonna tolerate them? There's a lot of questions to ask about glasses, but I think there's certainly children you could use multifocals in, sure. Okay, and how do you determine the addition that has to be prescribed? 
based on the lack of accommodation. So how much do you keep in mind? Yeah, my typical in, in the babies, um, and this is just from consultation with Dr. Leah, is to for the babies to put it at, uh, use a plus three for, for 30 centimeters, um, which is the communication distance for a baby and a parent. Um, as they get older, I think you just have to measure it, you know, like, like you would any other child. And, and also looking through dynamic retinoscopy, if you're gonna use a bifocal because they're hypoaccommodating, you can measure it and be sure you have the right prescription. Um, okay. And, and um, if, I think this, remember this is that low vision, is, low vision, hypoaccommodation, low vision is gonna be different than other reasons, you know, that you might use a bifocal, um, so. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Um, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Uh, if you can tell your name and uh, which organization you work with. Okay. Good night. I am Rosario Espinosa from Peru. Hi, Rosario. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's an excellent uh, conference. Uh, I want to know um, in this COVID time, which modifications do you uh, incorporate in your assessment? You know, um, we just got back to work <laughs> last week and we had a clinic with our birth through three team. Um, I had the OT and the family service coordinator and myself, the parent and child, and we did it. We just did a Zoom with with them all, and um, these were children I already knew, so I already had a cycloplegic refraction on them. I, uh, you know, I had a diagnosis, so that made it easier for me. Um, also, with um, some of the children through the school for the blind, I have a comprehensive history already. They've either seen another ophthalmologist, so I'm able to take take that and use it to help support the parents and the parent questions and the intervention questions. I haven't really done anything with like trying to figure out what ad they need or anything like that online, but I think um, there are some people doing that. Um, but my, I think my role in the, in the last couple of weeks I've been doing this is to be a support to the parent and try and answer their questions. And we're gonna start with CASP in a couple of weeks to see how we're gonna do it, so in Peru. Okay, thank you, thanks. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more question before we begin to close. Okay, so I, um, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, this was an absolutely fantastic talk. I think Lubaina expressed it well on behalf of all of us. As we see a lot of comments in the chat as well um, from people who appreciated the talk very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming online and uh, uh, doing this talk for us. Before we close, I just wanted to announce the next two talks have already been posted. I think uh, those who came to the website already to this event already know this website, training.visionaid.org slash webinar. And if you go here, you'll see all the previous sessions have recordings on them. And uh, we'll post the recording to this session within 24 to 48 hours. So you can find the recordings uh, there along with the slides. Um, the next talk uh, is about VisionAid and the VisionAid model. And I will be covering that uh, later this week. Uh, so that's Thursday this Thursday at 10 p.m. and at 7.30 a.m. in India on Friday. And then uh, following that, we have Dr. G. N. Rao and Dr. Bula Christie from the L.V. Prasad Eye Institute, who will be talking about L.V. Prasad's best practices and the models they have developed in running a low vision tertiary center. So if you go to this uh, website, you can also click on these different links up here. And you can click, if you want to learn more about VisionAid, you can click on uh, this link. It brings you into our site. And you know if you're interested 
you can go through the site to learn more about vision aid the work we are doing and you know um, if you're interested get involved as a volunteer or support the work we do so with that i think um, just want to thank everyone for taking time to join us and we hope to see you on the next webinar thank you